Welcome home, Larry Stogner, to here to the UNC School of Media and Journalism. Thank you. You know I live only five miles away, but it's amazing how difficult it is to get to the campus. <laughs> Not near as much as I'd like to. Well, we like having you here, and I really want to kind of go back to your roots of when you were dreaming of being a news per man, because that's what they certainly called yeah. him back then. But just want to start out by sort of letting people know that it's been six months or so since you told the community that you had a debilitating illness, mm -hmm. ALS kind of vision, right. and starting to lose your voice. And, and so to how to leave a job you've had longer than just about anybody in America being an anchorman, respected member of this community. How you doing? I, I feel pretty good. I have not lost any mobility so far, so far. But as you can tell, the voice continues to go south on me. And I have no idea how long I will have my speech at some point. I'm sure I will lose it. But yeah, uh, I came here as a freshman in 65. <laughs> Thought I was going to be a pharmacist. Had no idea how much science was involved. And I just lost interest in school. All I did was drink beer and cut glass. <laughs> the war was on, and one day I just said, this is silly. I thumbed home, joined the Air Force, gave it four years, went to Vietnam, came back. My head was screwed on right the second time around, and I think because I was a veteran, UNC let me come back. Uh -huh. And all of a sudden it was easy. And I figured out what I wanted to do. That makes a difference. It really did. And at that time, the School of Journalism was all print. And the only broadcast journalism uh, studies were in School of Radio, Television, Motion Pictures, now defunct. But so that's what I majored in. Mm -hmm. Tell me a little bit where you, what your home was like. You know, what town were you from, and kind of what drew you to UNC even. I was from Yanceyville, about 45 miles north of Chapel Hill, near the Virginia state line. 1,500 people max, small high school, but I was always a big UNC fan from the time I knew what a basketball was. So I knew I wanted to go here. My, we didn't have a lot of money, my mother, uh, through some contacts, got me a appointment to West Point. Wow. I didn't get in, however. But, I, but Mike Krzyzewski and I have compared notes. We would have been classmates had I gotten in. But uh, I got my acceptance at UNC, and that's where I really wanted to go anyway. And you took a, a, a movement toward Vietnam, which right in the midst of, you know, sort of an emotional debate in this country. Um, what was that? That had to shape you and change you. It did. When you've seen blackened Viet Cong bodies laying in the sun, school and professors don't seem that intimidating. <laughs> uh, bless, I knew what I wanted to do. When I was four years old, they're a little wiser. Uh, but uh, when you know what you want to do, it, it really helps you to focus uh, and get on the ball. And that's what I did. And back then, we were such a small market, 63rd market wow. in the country. 
uh, that we were able, they were able to hire students right out of college. <clears throat> you can't do that now. You have to start at Wilmington, New Bern, places like that. But uh, RAL uh, hired me. I worked there for three years anchoring and reporting. Three years later, I was at the uh, WTBD and stayed there for 39 years. Which, as a broadcaster, I know that is pretty phenomenal to last that long. It is when you look back at it. It seemed to have gone by quickly, but when I pile up all of the places I've been and people I've met, you have to back up and say, you did do a lot of stuff. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Tell me when you said you knew what you wanted to do. You know, we're trying to define for this generation what it is they'll do because everything's in disruption. What was it that you defined for yourself that you wanted to do? Well, there were several factors. When I was a kid, even eight, nine years old, I was always the one that wanted to follow the fire truck. <laughs> I wanted to be the first one to know and the first one to tell when something happened. Add that to the fact that my father had been a classic radio DJ. Ah. And I used to watch him spin records in the 50s, early 60s. I was used to being around the studio. I, I was not taken with being an anchor. That was the first job that opened up. I was still in school. Actually, I was anchoring a seven o'clock show for WRAL AM. Coming back to school, being a student, then I head over to Swain Hall and do an evening newscast for Channel 4. <laughs> and it was a busy day. Yeah. And then when I graduated, I went full time with RAL. But I would have been happy just being a reporter. That is where the creativity is in this business is where the fun is. Mm -hmm. It's where you learn a lot and meet an incredible number of people. And I always tell people, if they paid the same thing, I would be a reporter, not, not an actor. It just worked out that way. Well, you had those pipes, as they used to say, I right? Did. You I had did. those pipes. But let me ask you a question, because this school is known as you mentioned, for its great newspaper journalism, right? Great writers that came out of this. In the early 60s mm -hmm. and early 70s, when you were coming and thinking about it, broadcasting was not yet respected as a news mm -hmm. form. And uh, even my first 10 years in the business, I would get a lot of uh, uh, a lot of crap for newspaper reporters. We'd be at the legislature or the governor's news conference, and it was snarky about how much money you make. You're not a real journalist. And it was about that time that I decided, even though I knew what my audience was, I wrote to get their approval. The guys I knew who were the top, top writers for the News Observer, the Charlotte Observer, and I made a point to earn their respect. And I got it in time, and they, uh, they backed off. 
And did you ha find that there was also a lack of respect within UNC, where there's a kind of rival between the journalism school and radio, TV, and motion pictures? Well, there weren't enough uh, journalism courses available to me for me to get that involved in the J School. So um, I never felt that. But I knew that overall there was this huge divide between print, the real journalists, <laughs> and the pretenders on TV. Well, I'm glad you turned it around in one respect for all of our broadcasting wow. types. Um, you also nurtured um, lots of our grads because over the years people come here, they're watching you on TV. Were you aware that you became sort of what it meant to be a trusted broadcaster or a trusted news person? You know, um, I have heard that, but at the time I was unaware of it. Um, I was involved in helping along a number of people who went on to prominence. Stuart Scott, Byron Pitt, um, and a number of other students who ended up being journalists, general managers, news directors, in markets all across the country. Some people have said to me that they sort of looked on me as the, what they wanted in an anchor. And I never quite understood that. It's hard to put your finger on what it takes. All I ever tried to do was be fair, unbiased, not show my politics, and not overburden um, viewers with too much information that they could not handle. And that's sort of what I flew by. Um, anything beyond that is hard to put your finger on this thing called trust. Mm -hmm. I seem to have had that with a number of people. Don't know how, don't know why, but it is some sort of believability quotient involved in that. I just can't tell you how to get there. But it's also very fragile trust, and we're in this moment right now when all of a sudden one of the networks, the GOP, is saying journalists are becoming gotcha celebrities. They're not about really igniting the public right. conversation, which is a phrase we try to teach our students mm -hmm. that that's a responsible role they have to really mm -hmm. try to get a conversation in America going. Mm -hmm. Are you worried about a lack of trust in well, the news I, media? Well, I really am. I mean, Brian Williams was my favorite, and we lost him out of stupidity. He, did, he had enough uh, in his corner that he didn't have to invent things. The, the part that I see that's dangerous is this advocacy journalism where you're on one side or the other. To me that's not journalism at all. Journalism is telling a story that's truthfully and completely as you know how. Not deciding ahead of time which side you're going to be on or which candidates to ask the hard questions to. This thing with CNBC just a couple of weeks ago, the GOP debate was unforgivable. It was just ugly and it's one one sidedness and really got your questions. Yeah. I didn't like the tone of it. And I think once we lose trust, that's when America will not feel we're 
important to their lives. That's it's what really me. the only commodity, trust and truth, that uh, we deal with with the public. And I think it's been tainted. When you um, made your announcement, and there were some of us who kind of tried to make that uh, day of your last day on the set pretty powerful for you, and there came up with the Larry Stogner, you know, uh, broadcasting fund for students here. Yeah. I was told that you were really moved by that because it would be with young people. Tell yeah. me a little bit about what that meant to you. Well, I never expected anything like that, and, and I do thank you for that, for putting our station's name and, and my name onto something that important. You know, the governor gave me the order of the long leaf pine. Uh, you know, that's a friend and that's a great thing to hang on the wall, but it's not gonna help anyone. <laughs> this fund will help a lot of young students who are trying their best to break into this business. And breaking into it is the very hardest part. Once you get your foot in the broadcast journalism door, it can be fairly fluid, upwardly so, if you're good. And so I'm all for uh, giving a a hand up to students who were very much like me, who were kind of walking around the wilderness trying to figure out how to get into this. And it's a rich life being a news person. It is. I, I can't imagine having been a pharmacist or <laughs> an insurance salesman. Uh, you know, like you, when you were with the network, you get to travel to places you only dream about and interview presidents and top senators and fly with the Thunderbirds and go down on nuclear submarines. A kid from Yanceville couldn't ask for anything like that, so I feel blessed. And right now, it takes a lot of courage to keep up every day and yeah. to share all this with me. And you want to share with the public. You're thinking about writing. What do you want them to know? Oh, I'm trying to wrap my brain around a book. And I want to write the right kind of book. It's partially memoir, but it's also about my feelings about this business and my feelings about how I had to give it up and dealing with ALS on a day-to-day -day basis. So um, I've written much of the stories like my time in Haiti after the quake, my time in Afghanistan, and a lot of the political story. But what I'm looking for is the glue that's going to tie it all together and have it mean something to people. Trust and courage are two nice pieces of scotch tape and glue that sort of are a theme throughout your whole career. You might want to think about some of those yeah. things, you know? Yeah. Um, how'd you get to that signature line? Thanks for your company. I can't take complete uh, authority on that. I heard it once on the radio when I was a teenager. I said, that, that is com comfortable. And so the first time I got to use it, uh, a couple of people said they liked it. It just stuck. and. Uh, there have been several times over the years that we got squeezed 
at the end of the newscast because sports is last. And they have a way of running over, not paying attention to the time. And so if I did I said, just leave me five seconds. I I can deal with five. Those signs are ran over and slammed us in the network and I did get a chance to say thanks for the company. I felt awful uh, because that had just become my signature and uh, uh, over the years I hardly knew I was saying it after a while. It became so automatic. But in the thousands of card and letters, emails, and Facebook posts, you would be amazed how many people said that back to me. Pretty nice. Yeah. Pretty nice. This would be a wonderful uh, piece to have in our archive, so I really mean it. Larry Stryker, thanks for your company. You're more than welcome.